Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a podcast exclusively designed to create more reproductive health awareness and discuss your fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. This is a really exciting show for me. It's something near and dear to my heart. And today's topic is your complete guide to fertility testing. I think one of the hardest things to go through is being a fertility patient. I call it infertility. I don't like thinking of people as infertile. I think of you as being in fertility. And I use words like fertility patient. And I believe in the fertility of everyone who walks through my door. No one's a number to me. No one's an FSH level or an AMH level. But what do those things even mean? So that's what I want to talk to you about today. So no one gets married and says, oh my goodness, I can't wait to meet Dr. Amy. So if I can help one person who's watching the show never have to actually go through treatment because of something that they watched here, well, I would say that my mission is accomplished. So first of all, I want us to just all relax. It's just a stressful time in the world right now. And I think one of the biggest things associated with fertility could possibly be stress. So if you're in my office and I'm doing a procedure on you, I'm doing a blood draw or an ultrasound or a biopsy, it isn't unusual for me to ask you, find your happy place. Where is your happy place? So if you're watching right now, I want you to actively think and literally just think about your happy place. Find it. Really be able to describe it. Close your eyes. See what it looks like. Look at the stars, the sky, the scenery in front of you and be able to describe it. So when you're going through something stressful, like potentially some sort of fertility testing or treatment, you can then go to your happy place and maybe it just won't be so bad. You don't want to be stressed out. And when it comes to fertility testing, stress is actually one thing. It's really hard to test. There isn't a blood test that I can do for people that says you're too stressed out to get pregnant. However, if you're feeling stressed, chances are you might be too stressed. So I want people to be proactive about procreation and get your preconception labs drawn. That is a whole lot of P's. Proactive and preconception. So we spend a lot of time planning, let's say, vacation. We spend time planning our retirement, college funds, college. If only Americans spent just a little bit of the time that we spend planning a vacation on a future family, then maybe we wouldn't have as much trouble getting pregnant in the future. So I just put up a list of the basic preconception labs that we typically tend to do. So before you even get pregnant, it's a really good idea to know what your blood type is, to make sure you're not anemic, to check your thyroid, your vitamin D level, your prolactin level, and depending on your body size, if you're curvy, maybe even check your lipids, check your cholesterol, and depending on your age, maybe even a mammogram. Carrier screening refers to genetic testing to make sure you and your partner, your sperm donor, are genetically compatible. So how do you do those things? Well, you see a doctor. You can see your OBGYN or a fertility doctor like me who can get these levels done for you. And we can talk to you about the three things that I tell everyone about. And the three things are, what do you want? What is it going to take to get what you want? And are you willing to do it? And it seems silly when someone has seen me, sometimes they've been struggling for five years, eight years. And I ask them questions like, well, how many kids do you want? And they look at me like, at this point, we'd be happy with one. And I totally get that. But when it comes time to doing a fertility treatment, sometimes you can actually finally say, well, I do want two kids and then do the treatment that you need to accomplish that goal. So BMI is important. This is a picture of a scale. So BMI is a fertility test. We all know that the BMI is not actually the most accurate way of determining someone's, let's say, uh, body size and whether they're capable of being pregnant or not. I tell people that your fertility isn't skin deep. So don't pay so much attention about your body size, but at the same time, you don't want to ignore it. The waist-hip ratio may actually be a better guide as far as your fertility and looking at that level. But talk to your doctor about your body size and see if maybe gaining a little weight if your BMI is under 19 or losing a little weight if your BMI is over 30 would be ideal for you in your own situation. So let's talk about eggs. When it comes to eggs, There are different tests that you can do to look at the egg quality. FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone, estradiol, and AMH. So the FSH is secreted by the brain and it talks to our ovaries. 
and FSH goes up over time. So if your FSH is trending toward 10, it means your ovaries are having a harder time calling out the healthy eggs from your ovaries. That's a really good way of seeing it. However, the test doesn't tell us you have good eggs or you don't have good eggs. Typically, if your FSH level is going above 12, chances of having a really good egg go down. So we don't just look at your number, we look at your age and the follicle count to decide what your future fertility holds for you. So you can see from this chart and graph that the FSH level at your given age can be a predictor of your future pregnancy rate. So the other thing that we look at is, let's say, your egg count. So the egg count is done by looking at an ultrasound. So I want everyone to get an ultrasound. Why? Well, when you do a pelvic exam, you don't necessarily see things like fibroids. You don't necessarily see things like a polyp sitting in the lining of the uterus. The last thing I'd want someone to do is to be trying for a year to get pregnant and then all of a sudden find out that they have a big polyp right in the middle of their uterus that they could have removed a year previously. It's so hard to get pregnant. It seems like it shouldn't be so hard, but human beings are not like bunnies or mice. Each egg has a potential chance for pregnancy. And it isn't something that you can try every day to do. I mean, I wish we could get, try and get pregnant today and then find out tomorrow if we're pregnant. But it's like, hurry up, wait. You're going to ovulate and then hurry up and wait. And that wait is the hardest thing to do. AMH is another blood test. It's a hormone secreted by the cells that surround the ovaries. AMH levels go down over time. This is a test that you can do pretty much anywhere in your cycle. And FSH, estradiol, those are done at the very beginning of your cycle, cycle days one through four, potentially. So I've made it really easy. I have a website, eggwhisper.com. So through that site, it doesn't matter where you are, I can help you with these levels, with any of the tests that I've talked about today. We can get your levels checked. I can talk to you about what they mean for you and your personal situation. So one question a lot of people ask me is this. They say, Amy, here are my fertility hormone levels. I'm 31 years old. Can I wait? Can I wait? And maybe, you know, we're planning a trip here and there. I'm probably going to get a promotion. I might get relocated. Can I try to have a baby in a year or two years from now? So there's a test that you can do. It's called Fertile Ohm. Also, I mean, the way I guess the company came up with the test is genome and fertility. I think that's quite clever. I have nothing to do with the company. I'm not a uh, advisor. I'm not a board director. They don't pay me to speak or anything like that. I just talk about cool tests that I want people to know about. So with this test, it's a simple blood test, one, two, you'll actually find out your personal genetic profile. So your fertility is actually in your genes. You can gear treatment based on what you know from your DNA. And you can't ask your dad, hey, dad, when did you go through menopause? You just can't do that because men don't go through menopause. And most men don't know when their moms went through menopause. So this is the kind of test that will tell you potentially if there's something that you should know before you start your family to be a little bit more proactive. It can also help you if you've been struggling, figure out maybe why you've been struggling with either miscarriages, implantation issues, or potentially having lower egg quality. So what about the swimmers? So when it comes to sperm, it's really easy to count them. It's really easy for a guy to do a test. He just, you know, watches a dirty movie, collects in a cup. Maybe he does it at, at home, brings it into the IVF lab or the andrology lab. But when you look at the overall sperm count, all you can do is literally count the swimmers, right? So that's called a semen analysis. You look at the count, the motility, the shape. You can tell how fast the sperm are moving. You can tell the shape of the head, the neck, and the tail of the sperm. And then I can tell someone, yeah, the count's good. But I can't tell someone the count's good and embryo development's going to be really good with the sperm. Or the count is good and, you know, there's not going to be any issue with miscarriage in the future with the sperm. So what I want to talk about next are really cool tests that I think have basically really made a difference in terms of how we can help patients um, before, let's say, they do a treatment like IVF. So if you have some of this data first, then you'll be able to potentially do something differently. And there's one company, um, Reprosource uh, is the com company's name, and they've made it a lot easier for guys to do, uh, not inseminations, but semen analysis at home. So they have a temperature-controlled kit that they actually ship out to people and you produce a sample at home and then ship the kit back and they provide a very, very nice analysis of the sperm. So this is for guys who, let's say, are just a little bit shy. They don't wanna collect in a facility. They don't necessarily live, let's say, close to somewhere that can provide an analysis. So this is a good option for them. Another thing that was in the news was about how older fathers actually do lead to a lower IVF pregnancy rate. We're under the assumption that it's just about eggs, 
and having older eggs. And that's why IVF rates are lower as we get older. But as we get older, older women usually pair up with also older men. So the testing that I'm going to talk about now can kind of just guide you as to whether as an older father, and I recommend this test for every guy over 40, anyone with previous IVF, I don't like to use the word failures, but that's kind of what it is. Men who would, let's say, have a smoking history or other medical problems, like if they're on the heavier side, they have diabetes or hypertension or on other medications, or even if you're a smoker. Smoking, bad. Smoke, ki smoke kills. Don't kill your sperm. But the Episona test will kind of tell us a little bit about the genetics of your sperm and whether the sperm will cause poor embryo development or not. I think that's something pretty important for people to know before they go into IVF, especially if you're over 40 or you have a lower than average sperm count. The other thing that you can do is actually look at the fragmentation of the DNA in sperm. That's another test that you can do at home. It's a do-it-yourself test. Unlike the Episona test, where you just collect in a container and then you put it in the mail, this one is temperature control, and the sperm go out on liquid nitrogen or dry ice. And the instructions are super easy to follow. Results come in about three to five days, and I get a percentage. I get something called a DFI. And this DFI tells me if you should consider IVF because potentially the DNA fragmentation is on the lower side. But the cool thing about sperm, I wish I could say the same thing about eggs. I mean, eggs are super cool. Don't get me wrong. But the thing about eggs is that I can't tell a woman, hey, you can put yourself through an egg fitness challenge and improve your egg quality in two months. Whereas with sperm, you can totally do that. Not for everybody, but in a lot of cases, if you, let's say, have addressed low testosterone and you improve the testosterone, if someone has a really low sperm count, however, there are other tests that we do, like a Y, micros a y chromosome microdeletion and a chromosome analysis for men. And there's another test that's good for people who, let's say, are considering IUI, and that's called the CAP score. So the CAP score will determine exactly when you should time your insemination. And that might be really important to you if, let's say, IVF is definitely not an option for you and you want to make sure that you're doing your IUI in your perfect fertile window to make sure that the egg and sperm are meeting and fertilizing at the same time. So we've talked about eggs, we've talked about sperm, and now we have the embryo transport system. So with the fallopian tubes, what I tell people is that the fallopian tube is like the diameter of a strand of hair. So it's very difficult to see on ultrasound unless it's filled with water, and that's called a hydrosalpinx. But sometimes even a hydrosalpinx you can't visualize on ultrasound. There are a couple different ways. There's actually three ways of looking at fallopian tubes. One way is through an ultrasound or sonogram. Okay, so there's a procedure called a saline infusion sonogram, and that's done basically like a pap smear, where a speculum is placed, and then a small catheter is placed in the cervix. The cervix connects the vagina with the uterus, and we just push fluid through the uterus, and we can actually watch it come out the fallopian tube. It's really quite pretty, and it's really fun to do. And there's a company called FemView, and they offer a test that allows you to see the fallopian tubes on ultrasound, and you can actually see if the fallopian tubes are open. The other thing that you can do is the dye test or the evil dye test. So the horrible, horrible dye test. Everyone talks about the tubal study, also known as the histro, which stands for uterus, salpingo tube, and gram picture. So the HSG is a horrible test. And people have talked about it as being the most pain that they've ever been in their life when, when they do that test. But if you're a patient of mine, that's not going to happen. And the reason why that's not going to happen is I don't believe in pain. I mean, pain medications are here for a reason. I recommend to all my patients to take a Valium and a Tylenol with codeine or something equivalent 30 minutes before. Make sure you have a driver. You can also take uh, Motrin, and I also recommend antibiotics. So talk to your doctor before you do the HSG test so that you don't have exquisite pain or any PTSD issues after this kind of test. What the HSG does is basically by pushing radio opaque dye through the uterus and out the fallopian tubes, you can actually watch and see if the fallopian tubes are open or not. The other way of doing it is through laparoscopy. So laparoscopy is where you drop a camera down your belly button, and then you can take a look at your fallopian tubes after pushing blue dye through to see if the fallopian tubes are open. Okay, so another test now that we're talking about the tubes looking at the uterus is a test to look to see if there's endometriosis in the lining of the uterus, and that's called the receptiva test. And what it's looking for is a marker of inflammation or endometriosis called BCL6. So that's usually done between cycle days 7 through 11, and that is a biopsy. So it's also quite painful, especially if you're not taking pain meds. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. So just be sure you're, you know what you're getting yourself into. Talk to the, your doctor about the test, the procedure, what's involved, what medications they're going to give you to make it less painful. Along those lines is a hysteroscopy. 
So that's where you take a camera and look inside the uterus. So while I've mentioned a whole bunch of tests, you don't need all these tests, but you need to talk to someone to see which test is actually right for you. Okay, so now we talked about the lining of the uterus. What about when embryos go in the uterus? How do you know when they should actually go in? There's another test that you can do looking at the lining, and that's called the endometrial receptivity assay. And there's actually a way to build all these tests into a treatment cycle, so you don't feel like you're just constantly being poked and prodded, although that is sometimes how it feels when you're going through all of this stuff. So the other thing, another study that recently came out in human reproduction, was about how PGS, or genetic testing of embryos, can actually improve pregnancy rate. So we think about embryos like diamonds, they're so beautiful. But embryos don't always behave like diamonds. Just because a diamond's gorgeous on the outside doesn't mean that that diamond or embryo has the genetic integrity to turn into a viable pregnancy on the inside. So you can do tests looking at the structure of the chromosomes of an embryo before you actually put the embryo inside the uterus. So that's something that it's not like I tell patients you have to do it, but I want patients to know about all these things before they do a treatment. Because I never want anyone to look at me and say, why didn't you tell me about this first? Because if you had told me about it, I would have done it. So I think it's important to know what it takes to have, let's say, a 100% pregnancy rate, as if there's such a thing, and then figure out what you can do to give yourself the highest chance of pregnancy. And you can do something as basic as, let's say, finding out that your TSH level or thyroid level is abnormal and treating it. And then that's what all you have to do, basically, to give yourself that chance of pregnancy that you didn't know you could have done unless you had tested for your thyroid. There are a couple other things to talk about. And one is the genetic compatibility between you and your partner or you and your sperm donor. And that's with genetic carrier screening. So the way I think about it is this. Look, um, it's not like testing for your genetics, let's say, to find out if you're a carrier of, let's say, cystic fibrosis, means that you're not going to love a baby any less if it has cystic fibrosis. But if you were to find out pre-pregnancy that you and your partner were, let's say, carriers for the same disease, like cystic fibrosis, you could at least be prepared for what your life might look like. Or you could choose to genetically test embryos pre-pregnancy. There are a lot of things that are scary, and one of the scariest things is finding out in pregnancy that your baby is affected with a disease like cystic fibrosis. So finding out pre-pregnancy might give you options that you didn't know you, you had unless you had known about it. Okay, so there's a new company out there called Gene Peaks, and they're looking at carrier screening just a little bit differently, and it kind of just has changed how we think about carrier screening, because we're all carriers for about one to three diseases, but what Gene Peaks is doing is they're taking both partner, egg and sperm, and looking at their DNA together, and they're looking at the future baby and what diseases the baby may have. So they're not giving you a carrier screen report, and that's so different than what we're used to. We're so used to getting a report and says, that says egg carries these three diseases, sperm carries these three diseases, and then you just look at the list and you say, okay, they don't both carry the same diseases, and then you move on. But with Gene Peaks, the report looks a little bit different. So with all the companies and the tests that I've talked to you about, they'll all talk to you about their technology. If you just call them, they'll do a consult with you, and then you can see if the test is right for you. So I want everyone to keep calm, just like I said, find your happy place, and get ahead of infertility. I want everyone to be to just reach their goals, to have the least amount of heartache and tears, because I deal with heartbroken people every day, all day long. And I want people to basically, you know, find their jackpot in a doctor that believes in them. So I just want to thank everyone for being here. Well, have a great night. Thank you so much for listening and making The Egg Whisperer Show a part of your weekly routine. To find show notes and a full transcript for this episode, visit dramy.org and look under the blog tab. While you're there, you can find a link for the Egg Whisperer newsletter, which keeps you in the know about fertility news. You can also find Dr. Amy and the Egg Whisperer show on YouTube, Instagram, or Facebook. If you'd like to learn even more, Dr. Amy offers classes at the Egg Whisperer School, eggwhispererschool.com, or you can request a consultation on dramy.org. Thank you so much for tuning in and for sharing the Egg Whisperer show with others. Keep sparkling and have a great day.